So it's um, my great pleasure to introduce uh, one of our own as a colloquium speaker for this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Bob Norwood is a professor here at the College of Optical Sciences, uh, where he performs research in photonics materials and devices. Uh, prior to this uh, current position, uh, he spent 15 years in R&D leadership positions uh, at both Fortune 100 corporations and uh, venture capital-backed uh, startups. Uh, he is a world expert in polymer integrated optics and optical materials uh, with more than 100 refereed publications, seven book chapters, 29 issued patents, and 65 invited talks. Uh, he's served as a conference chair or co-chair for various OSA and SBIE conferences, uh, and he is the associate editor of um, Optical Materials Express. He is an OSA fellow, an SBIE fellow, uh, as well as a member of the APS and the IEEE. Uh, he uh, holds a PhD in physics from the University of Pennsylvania and obtained his uh, bachelor's of sciences degrees in, in physics and mathematics from MIT. And today he's going to talk to us about uh, advances in organic nonlinear photonics. Uh, and please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Bob Norwood. Uh, thanks, Matt. And thanks to all of you um, for coming. And it's a pleasure. Uh, I, I'm kind of pinch hitting here. I was asked uh, a couple weeks ago. So, so I have to apologize to anyone who came to my sign lecture about three weeks ago. Some of this is from that, uh, because I'm pinching, but some of it is not. You know, so, uh, so stick around, because I'm going to start with the stuff you know, and I'm going to move to stuff you don't uh, toward, the, toward the end. And first, I want to explain uh, the title. So organic means I'm mostly going to be talking about materials that have carbon in them. Okay, So that's the organic part. Uh, nonlinear is I'm mostly going to be talking about things that are uh, nonlinear optical effects and uh, including the electro-optic effect in that, in that uh, definition. Um, and then finally, photonics. Usually when I say photonics, I mean it's happening in a waveguide, in some kind of guided environment. You know? uh, so uh, photonics has a broader meaning than that, but in this context, uh, I'm not talking about bulk materials. Uh, 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 I'm talking about light that's somehow guided. Okay, and uh, so let's get started. I'm going to have a brief introduction. The motivation for most of my work is is communication technology and optical communication and information technology. It's broadened out over the years, but uh, that's the core. So my introduction is sort of that's the motivation for much of it. Then I'm going to talk about. EO polymer modulators and uh, some of the advances that we have made here and some of the advances that are coming down uh, the pike uh, from uh, new materials that are available and new ultra-compact uh, geometries that we're pursuing. So uh, that will be the sec for those of you who have a uh, course of non optics, that's the second order part of the talk, so that's second order non optics. And then, then we'll move on to two topic areas in third order nonlinear optics. One, liquid core optical fiber, uh, which uh, is a very interesting flexible platform for organic nonlinear photonics. And then microbubble optical resonators, a recent, relatively recent work we've been doing on ultra-efficient organic nonlinear photonics in a resonator geometry. And uh, there we'll see that we can do nonlinear optics at sub-milliwatt powers without uh, too much trouble. Okay. And then... Finally, I'll just wrap up. Okay, so so what's going on in the world that drives all this are these uh, challenging network trends. And, and if you look out and see what's happening uh, to the internet, uh, the 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 current YouTube, just YouTube traffic today, YouTube traffic today is what the entire backbone traffic was 14 years ago. So the entire everything everything that went across the internet, you know, in, in a year. Right today, YouTube, that YouTube comprises that. Um, you know, the, the, the growth in the demand is uh, tremendous. You, know, you have 45 exabytes uh, to 50 exabytes per month growth in 2013. That's the traffic, 50, exabyte, 50 exabytes per month. And an exabyte, one exabyte, is 50,000 years of DVD quality video. So, uh, so you can imagine. A lot of this is the internet turning into uh, a streaming uh, video machine, right? Uh, and 
a lot of things are going to happen based on that, I think, in the coming years. A lot of them good for optics, because I think a lot of the value of the Internet has been basically stolen by the people at the end of the chain for the last 10 or 15 years, and now it's time to pay back. <laughs> so I think you're going to see a change in that over the next few years. Uh, and uh, an important part of all this is the fact that there's optics happening now inside huge computer centers like this one that Google has. So to keep the search experience and everything else they do uh, cranking along, they increasingly have to look at connecting their computers with optics. Okay? So that's a, a, those are big drivers. The, the one is just a driver for more performance and higher capacity. The other is a driver for things that are much smaller, much cheaper, much lower power consumption that can sit inside computer centers. The, the greatest achievement in photonics is still, in my opinion, optical fiber. And uh, that's, if you're going to do something in photonics, uh, you can't go too much wrong by starting with optical fiber as your guide because it's going to give you a lot of options in terms of what you can do. So uh, a lot of what I'll talk about today happens in this magic place, 15, 15 nanometers, where it just so happens that silica optical fiber has a minimum in its uh, attenuation. And uh, we were also given erbium to amplify light there. So that's why the Internet is possible. Without that, we don't have an Internet, okay. from an economic point of view, not just a scientific point of view. Basic optical fiber network. You've got a transmitter that, in an optical fiber network, you know, you're sending out digital information. So that's what our little pulses are, are there. We have a fiber. Fiber, unfortunately, as Fiber for all its wonder, wonder and, uh, and uh, excellence does over distance uh, distort those pulses. So there's some distance at which the pulses will be unrecognizable, but up to that point, we can recover the initial information in our receiver. And that transmitter is usually a dial laser. And uh, if I'm just transmitting uh, relatively low speed data, short distances, I can just turn the laser on and off. Very simple. Just send current to the dial laser on and off. But if I'm sending distance uh, information very long distance or I'm sending very high uh, rates of information, I can't do that. The, the, uh, the uh, laser will just not allow me to modulate it uh, in such a way that it either is linear enough or um, high speed enough. So then the external modulation. And most of what is out uh, on the Internet today, most of the traffic on the Internet is externally modulated. It's in some way or other at uh, 10 gigabits per second and, and up. So 10 gigabits per second, 25 gigabits per second are out there. Some 40 gigabits per second is out there. 40 gigabits per second is already used in some of these data center environments. And then on the other side, we have a receiver. We're not going to talk so much about the receiver here, but we will talk quite a bit about the, the transmitter. And if you go out into the into the internet, you have something that looks pretty much like this. Uh, there's, this was a diagram that I constructed years ago, and really what's happened is over time, these things have started to actually move into the diagram. Uh, OADMs are, and reconfigurable OADMs now are quite common. Um, the, the two ends have not changed dramatically, uh, other than the fact that you have much more sophisticated receivers uh, due to the fact that phase is now being used uh, increasingly in terms of the uh, uh, increasing the capacity of the internet, the phase of the signal. And you need these uh, very, uh, very good lasers with uh, tight line widths, and you need to be able to filter them out to within sub-nanometer uh, levels. And that's all doable, and it's also doable to make uh, very good external modulators. Now, how these external modulators work? Well, they actually need nonlinear optics. So what is nonlinear optics? And nonlinear optics is a broader a uh, term that's, that's uh, applied to a uh, nonlinear relationship between induced polarization and electric field. This is one common way to write it. And so you have the polarization and all of linear optics, everything you've learned in linear optics is basically here. You know, we basically assume that the electric field, the polarization that's induced is linearly uh, related to the electric field. Chi 1 is, of course, related to the refractive index. And uh, you know, we can... Uh, uh, do everything that you've done in optics you know, uh, and create an entire uh, system around that. This is the first nonlinear term. And these nonlinear terms, these coefficients, these chi's, um, they fall off very, very dramatically. And you know, early on, and uh, you know, uh, Professor Bomberg is here, and early on he, he explained that the, 
what's happening there is you, you have to consider the electric field, the size of the electric field that an electron feels in an atom. And you're, you're really you're looking at that. And these fall off in powers of, of, of that. Uh, so your, your applied field is very, very small compared to those types of fields. So this chi-2 is a, very, is a much smaller number than chi-1, and chi-3 is, is uh, accordingly another uh, order of perturbation and another many orders of magnitude down from chi-3. Nevertheless, in the proper situation, you can take advantage of these uh, very small uh, numbers. One way is electro-optic modulators. Uh, now, electro-optics is it's kind of a little bit of a cheat, so if you go back to the second order term, I've got two fields. One of them is my optical field, and the other one, in this case, is an electrical field. So it's a low-frequency electrical field. But it's not only optics um, because I have two fields involved. And uh, you know, what can I do with uh, second order again? I can, I, I can make, I can make uh, new frequencies. Everybody's got green laser pointers today. They're all based on frequency doubling uh, in, a, in, a, in a, a little crystal that's inside your laser pointer. And uh, it can also generate, I mean, amazingly, so, so I, think, I think intentional nonlinear optics sort of, okay, you can work to make this happen. You can make great crystals. You can make these devices, which we'll talk a lot about later in the talk, things like electro-optic modulators and switches. But, but it turns out that it, in the wrong situation or the right situation, depending on how you look at it, even very low optical powers, when put together in the wrong way, can create problems. So when they first put optical fiber networks, that involved multiple wavelengths down underneath the uh, ocean now about uh, close to 20 years ago, um, they, they noticed that there, were, there was noise coming into uh, the spectrum at these, uh, 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 these uh, frequencies. When they have two frequencies, if they had another signal there, they, they would come in. This is really a third order nonlinear optical effect that is happening because you have a perfect storm of a very long, low attenuation medium, which is optical fiber. You have wavelengths spaced on a comb, which you know, can easily add and subtract into uh, winding up at where the other wavelengths are. And you have a high intensity because you have a very, very uh, small waveguide. And of course, Professor Obama, I'm very happy I do came because uh, he's famous for actually winning the, the Nobel Prize. Uh, and one of his key contributions there was you know, creating this field. So I'm very glad you came. OK, so let's, let's move on now to, to specifics in the electro-optic case. So, so the key effect that we will be making uh, use of today in electro-optics is the Pockels effect. And this is Pockels. And uh, this was an effect that was discovered well before the laser was invented because it didn't require high optical intensities. It only required a high DC electric field intensity, which could be you know, created in the 19th century. You know, so basically, uh, the idea here is you have a, uh, a change of refractive index is induced by a DC field. And this DC, you know, as you see, you know, we, we, you, 40 gigahertz is basically treated as DC in this case for, for many systems, uh, but it's you know, well below optical. And the, I've suppressed the tensorial nature of this coefficient R, which is related to the chi-2 coefficient. So just written as a scalar for simplicity. But basically, it does depend on both the direction, generally depends on the direction of the applied field and the direction uh, of the uh, polarization of the light beam. So that's called the linear electro-optic coefficient or the Pockels coefficient. And again, this, this effect has been known for uh, more than 100 years. So how big is this effect? Well, again, it's not only optics. That R is directly related to chi-2 uh, you know, by you know, basically is there the same order of magnitude. There's uh, some numerical factors that relate them. And so let's just look at this. What, how big a delta N can I generate? Well, I've got I've got n equals 2, let's say. This is lithium niobate. So there's a famous material called lithium niobate. And r equals 50 picometers per volt. So what field is required to obtain 1 times 10 to the minus 4th, which sounds like a pretty small number um, in, in index? Well, it turns out I need about you know, half a megavolt per meter field to do that. That's a big field. Um, if you try and apply that to a bulk crystal, so let's say I've got a bulk crystal that's a centimeter in size, I need 5 kilovolts. And if anybody in this room has used a Pockel cell, that's what you're doing. You know, you're using, that's what you have to do, right? You have a crystal that's big, and you apply 5 kilovolts to it, and boom, you get this refractive index change, and you're very happy. 
so, so this leads us to the next area that, that nonlinear photonics takes advantage of, which in this case is a very uh, uh, simple one in a way, in that we can get that same field by bringing the electric, uh, electrode spacing down by orders of magnitude, which also brings the voltage down by orders of magnitude. So this is why you want to make a waveguide device where you can put the electrode, say, 10 microns apart instead of a centimeter apart, and then, and then need only 5 volts to drive it instead of 5 kilovolts. So what's a waveguide? Uh, brief review of planar dielectric waveguides. So, you know, uh, if you've taken photonics course, you've seen this. And uh, this is just a very simple planar dielectric waveguide. I've got a core, N1. I've got a uh, cladding material, in this case, on top and bottom, N2. And I have total internal reflection happening at that interface. And uh, so we can go back to the good old total internal reflection condition here. And for angle theta, so this is the angle theta I'm talking about. For angle theta that uh, are uh, of the, you know, less than this, uh, this quantity, I'm going to be able to guide light. Okay, so basically, as long as I keep that angle theta below that quantity, I'm going to be able to guide light. And, uh, and then I can, I can derive, actually, a very simple condition for the modes of, of light guiding, because a, a mode of a, of a waveguide is essentially a spatial profile that is independent of the, direction, of the distance along the waveguide. So if I cut the waveguide at any point, spatial profile of mode looks the same, which is different if you're not in a mode. Then every point I would cut it at, I would see uh, a different spatial profile, or some combination of modes. And you can easily solve for those modes because you need to simply determine what the phase shifts are at reflection there in the dielectric, which you can get from the good old Fresnel relations. And uh, you're, th this is just a self-consistency condition on the path length. And, and there you go. So you, you have uh, this transcendental equation. You can solve the transcendental equation. And uh, here we plot the uh, uh, you know, right-hand side of the equation versus sine theta. Uh, here you plot the left-hand side versus sine theta. The left-hand side is simply a tangent function with diverges you know, uh, periodically. And the right-hand side is this simple function here, which goes to uh, terminates when you're equal to the critical angle. So above the, beyond, the, beyond that, then I can't guide it anymore. Okay. So, so this waveguide's got eight modes. For most of the things that we're talking about, we want, um, we want to have uh, only uh, 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 one mode. So we don't want, we don't want uh, more than one mode for, for the types of devices we're talking about today. Okay. And on the bottom is actually a, a special case when the claddings are mirrors. So, so you can make some very good waveguides out of a variety of materials. This is actually um, I, the second time today I've shown this, uh, this, uh, this picture. Actually, I showed it in my class this morning uh, in a completely different context. But uh, this is... This is a, a two-dimensional waveguide. The, the, what happens here, instead of having that planar one, I'd like to be able to couple to an optical fiber, which is a two-dimensional waveguide, so I have to pattern it somehow. So I use lithography, and uh, in this case, we use reactive ion etching to etch away this uh, fluoropolymer material. So this is a fluoropolymer, very low-loss optical polymer. And uh, you can see these very smooth walls here that we got from that process, and, uh, and this very nice uh, light guiding here and uh, about a 4 by 4 micron uh, core. That's because optical fiber has about an 8 micron diameter core. So if you want to couple to that, you want something. Generally, uh, you can couple to a, it's a fairly broad range of dimensions depending on your index. But if your index contrast is about the same, you're, you're going to be looking at that kind of size. Yeah. So got to make, we want to make waveguides. Now you know how waveguides work. Um, we want to do uh, we want to do electro optics and waveguides because we don't want to use those five kilovolts. So what are we going to do electro optics with? Uh, well, what I want to do with is an organic material, so I want to use electro optic polymers. And uh, electro optic polymers, uh, this is a, a chart that basically shows you how they work. So electro optic polymers c consist of these, and uh, maybe a good view here of a molecule. It's a molecule. A molecule has uh, what's called a, a donor side. So it's electron-rich side. It has a, uh, a side that wants to give away electrons. It has a, uh, it has a conduit. It's basically a wire, double bonds. And then it has a side that wants to suck in electrons, the acceptor. Uh, and uh, so you, what you have actually is a polar molecule. So this has, a net, this has a net dipole moment. It's a little dipole that you can orient in a field. 
And, uh, you know, I, I work with the best chemists in the world at doing this, and, uh, you know, they, they, they are constantly creative and coming up with new ways to do this well. But the key thing is mobile electrons, donor, and acceptor, okay? So you get a dipole, and you also get a very large microscopic nonlinear hyperpolarizability. So th this is the microscopic version of chi 2 is something called beta, and that is very large in some of these molecules, as we'll see. And uh, again, you've got this delta n that we already calculated. Now, the, the n uh, cubed is, is important, too, so you have to keep an eye on that. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But, but, how do, but the thing is, if I just take these molecules and I throw them into a polymer, which is typically what people do, so they take a molecule like this, they throw them into a good optical polymer, how do I, is that a chi-2 material? And the answer is no, because it doesn't have the right symmetry. A chi-2 material has to have something called non-centro symmetry. So, which means that if I'm sitting at some position of the material and I look that way, it looks different if I look that way. Okay, so it's not, it's not centrosymmetric. Many materials are centrosymmetric. Glass, any morph most amorphous materials are centrosymmetric. I should make it non-centrosymmetric. So what I do is I pull it, and I'll show you a little cartoon of the polling uh, next slide, but the idea is to apply an electric field to this system under high temperature. These, these, little, these little dipoles will rotate. They'll rotate to align themselves with the field. We'd love it if they look like that. They don't look like that. They, they look about 20% oriented in the best case. So we're, we're leaving about a factor of five of electro-optic coefficient on the table until we figure out how to really orient these things. But, uh, but, but you can orient them. Here's the cartoon. So you have this system with these little dipoles sitting all over the place. I apply a, a field. I raise the temperature. The... Uh, dipoles magically align, and, uh, and then I cool it down under field. And then they freeze in, because this polymer is a high, what's called a high glass transition to polymer, so I have to heat it to about 135, 140 degrees C for it to do that. And now I've got an electro-optic material. An electro material that I can put anywhere. I can put it on you know, any kind of substrate. I can put it on top of other circuitry. It's basically a, 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 a a flexible material, and, and people have even made flexible modulators out of these types of materials. A little bit better view of what these molecules look like. You get a really good uh, feeling here for, whenever you see these double bonds, that's called a conjugated system. That means that there, there's sort of a, a, a very easy conducting path through the, what are called the pi orbitals of the, of the carbon atoms for the electrons to, to move all the way from here to here. And the farther they can move, basically the higher the nonlinearity of that molecule uh, in uh, many cases. And then we put them into a polymer that might look like something like this. All of you use this material every day. It's what, it's what DVDs are made of. It's what uh, you know, CDs are made of. Uh, it's a good optical polymer, high temperature. Okay. So, so these polymers, um, remarkably now, are uh, really, uh, really getting to, to some tremendous values. And I think for, for people who do research and want to, f want to look at new nonlinear optical materials. I think the, the, the single biggest thing that's happened in the last couple of years is that there's now a company that sells these materials. And you just go to them and buy them. There are people that we know found the company uh, up, uh, that are spin out from the University of Washington, and they are very, very good at what they do. And uh, you can just call them up. You can do a web search on Selectra. You can call them up and, and, and buy their polymer. It's not cheap, I'll tell you that, but you can just buy it, and you can use it, and they'll tell you how to use it. And, uh, and it, it has these kind of properties, which are you know, uh, best in the world, uh, this R3-3 coefficient. Now, if you look at, uh, I have a figure of merit here, which is uh, basically just related to n cubed times, uh, times R, and uh, with a correction for the alpha. So if you look at this, you say, okay, well, lithium niobate has been pretty good. Now we finally have a material that's better than lithium niobate. And the reason for that is this, this this, this uh, column here, you see alpha is basically the optical loss when I go through that material. Lithium niobate is very good, um, and some of the first generation polymers weren't quite so good. Even this polymer is not as good as lithium niobate, but it has a much larger electro-optic coefficient. So uh, it, this polymer barely beats out lithium niobate, but that's assuming that I can make an infinitely long device. Whenever you, whenever you see people use a figure of merit, you have to kind of be careful, you know, because this figure of merit essentially says, it doesn't matter how long I make my device. I haven't built in any limit on the length, and that's why the, the, uh, the absorption coefficient is so important. But if I say I want to make a 40 gigahertz modulator, 
Well, 40 gigahertz modulator, I can't make it any longer than two centimeters. Not because of the optical materials, because gold isn't very good. Uh, you know, basically, the electric field that I would start down this modulator uh, will be gone in two centimeters. So that's about as long as I can make it. So when I put that in, well, then the situation looks much different. Right? Now, the you know, with that limitation, is now five times worse than this commercially available polymer. And uh, it, it uh, I think, uh, has the potential to really completely change how people do things uh, in electro-optics. So this is a, a plot actually was put together by Selectra, which shows the progress over just the last 15 years or so, starting in uh, the year 2000 at about 50 picometers per volt, now at 250 picometers per volt, um, and, uh, and also showing thermal stability reaching values that are needed for communications and also for, um, for uh, aerospace applications. And on this plot, actually we see two things. The loss being under control basically, but the other thing that's very important here is that the power handling has improved significantly. One of the problems early on with these materials was they would not withstand uh, even, even a few milliwatts of 15, 15, uh, 15, 15 nanometer power without, uh, without being damaged. A uh, number of effects that go on. One of the strange things, one of the, one of the strange things is that oxygen, oxygen molecules actually absorb uh, one to two micron light fairly well, especially at 1310, but also 1550. So if oxygen absorbs light, it actually becomes a, a Pac-Man. It eats anything in its path. It, it turns into a free radical, and if it's, whatever it's around, it attacks, and it easily attacks these materials. So the polymers are there. You can buy them. But remember, a waveguide needs, it needs, a, it needs something that the light's traveling through, and then it also needs a way to confine it. So that turns out to be a very important aspect of this. Those, uh, that leads us to a uh, brief discussion of the materials we've used to confine the light in these waveguides, uh, sol gels. Sol gels are basically glass materials, uh, glassy-like materials. It's, a, it's a, basically a wet chemistry way to make glass. And the classic sol gel process, you do chemistry and then you fire it like a ceramic. We don't do that. We basically uh, we, we, we make a glassy type of polymer. We spin it out just like a photoresist. And we, we have the flexibility of using a number of different materials. Uh, this is a measurement of the loss of uh, one of those one of those sol gels that was developed uh, here, and uh, by by uh, Roland Himmelhuber, and you can see that the the loss is uh, quite low, much you know lower than than any of the EO polymers we saw. So that's that's quite good. One of the strange things that we discovered about these types of high materials, uh, and you have to think about how this device has to be made. So you remember I had a polling process, and I've got a waveguide. Well, when am I going to pull a polymer? I mean, I could pull it. I could pull a single film of polymer, but then all I've got is a film. And I don't have a waveguide yet. I have to put these other things around it to have a waveguide. Well, how do I put the waveguide uh, materials around it after I pull the polymer film? Not so easy. So the easy thing to do is to pull the whole thing, to make a, a stack and pull the, pull the waveguide. But that doesn't always work very well, because the field that you're applying to the polymer has to make it to the polymer. If it has to go through materials that aren't compatible, it won't make it. So we discovered this you know, very interesting thing, was that for some of your polymers, when you put the polymer on the sol gel, not only were you able to get the same electro-optic coefficient that you got for a single layer film uh, with two electrodes on it, let's say, but you could get more. You could actually get a higher electro-optic coefficient, and that was largely because you suppressed breakdown. The thing that often limits that orientation that we were talking about is that the, you just get dielectric breakdown, which you, know, you get uh, 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 whenever you have too high a field uh, in a dielectric. And uh, so that was a, a major uh, discovery. And, and in any case, usually we get very high efficiency of polling. So we can make a structure. This is a typical uh, type of device structure that can be made to, to take advantage of the electro-optic effect and, used in a, and can be used in a transmitter. This is called, so you all know what a Moxander interferometer is. This is a Moxander interferometer, but with electro-optic material uh, in these waveguides here so that when you apply a voltage, uh, to this system, you change the index actually in this particular picture in both this waveguide and this waveguide in opposite directions, and you wind up uh, getting a transfer function that looks like this. Unfortunately, no one wants this transfer function because it's nonlinear. And, uh, and when you look at the RF applications of uh, RF being uh, analog applications of these types of devices, everyone hates the fact that you have this nonlinear transfer function because it limits the linearity and, linearity and dynamic range of your devices. But for digital, it's fine. No one, no one cares. You just need a one and a zero. Uh, and, uh, and 
v pi is the key number we're always trying to, to, to get hold of and get lower. And this is our electrode spacing. That's the, the key of the whole thing. That's why I'm in a waveguide. Remember, I want to make electrodes close. Then n cubed r, those are material quantities. L is just the length. I can always make it better by making it longer, but I just told you that I can't always make it longer for either optical or electrical loss reasons. And then this is this magical factor called uh, gamma, which is the overlap. So that's really the overlap between the electric field I apply and the optical field. And you want that to be 1. It's never 1. It's always less. So that raises v pi a little bit. And this is a busy slide, but you know, it basically shows all the different types of modulators you can easily make with you know, polymers. Phase modulators, that, that's just, just the phase, uh, so you don't, it's not an amplitude modulator. You can turn into an amplitude modulator, it turns out, by putting some external polarization uh, optics around it. Single arm Mizender, dual arm Mizender. At the end of the day, you can make, uh, you can make some pretty low voltage devices. The lowest, lowest voltage device we've ever made is about 0.6 volts. Uh, v pi, which is very low, uh, and among the lowest ever demonstrated. And we've demonstrated, uh, you know, I always like to show this because I just like to see actual modulation. Yeah, so there you go. <laughs> so, so this is a modulator. This is probably, this is a commercial quality modulator that was made in this, in this facility by uh, Krista Rose, who's a senior staff member at Sandia now, uh, some years back when we were, you know, basically pushing this as far as we could go with it. And you can see the stream of publications we've had over the last seven, eight years that continue to push this technology. And where we're pushing it now, uh, as I'll get to in one more slide, is uh, silicon. So, so this is, this is the, the characteristics of that module we were just watching going on and off. Uh, and this, was a, this is still, in terms of the combination of insertion loss and VPI, it's probably the best electro-optic polymer modulator anybody's made, um, as far as I know. Uh, even though there are commercial ones that, that commercial ones don't 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 reach these numbers yet, so I, I wanted to tell you one other thing before I go to silicon, and that is a very recent demonstration by Oscar Herrera in our group. Um, a really cool uh, thing here. So basically, what this is is I, I've been talking about you know making uh, modulators and turning light on and off with modulators, but another thing that these devices are going to do is they can act as antennas. So I, so I, so what we did is we made an antenna. Uh, we, had, we had some collaborators at the Air Force who designed this antenna. And uh, this is a fully pigtail, so the fiber's coming in. It's attached here. Kang Jo Kim in our group is a real expert at, at, at the packaging side of, uh, of nonlinear optics and nonlinear photonics. So we have light coming into this. We have free space microwave that uh, Ron Vorkaranam got this all set up. So we could generate uh, uh, mi microwaves in the air. And uh, the, the antenna just picks them up. So how do we see what's going on? Well, the easiest way to do that is to send, uh, to send an, optical, uh, an optical signal through there and just look at an optical spectrum analyzer. And if the electro-optical effect happens, well, I'm going to get a shift of the optical frequency by the, the frequency of the microwave that's applied. I will see that, and I will easily see that. And uh, so you can see here, this is a paper that's now impressed for general lightweight technology. And this is with no field applied, and then when we apply the field, you can see this. these two sidebands are exactly where we expected. We, we checked to make sure that there wasn't any weird pickup going on and stuff like this. This is real. And uh, so, so you have a basically uh, a, what's called an RF over fiber demonstration. And, uh, what, you know, long term, if you had uh, these properly engineered, you know, it may provide a new way to go directly from wireless communication to, uh, to fiber. So I do want to talk a little bit about uh, recent work we've been doing in silicon, and then I'm going to move over to third order nonlinear optics. So in silicon, the reason people want to work with silicon is, well, uh, there's a tremendous infrastructure developed already for working with silicon and making devices in silicon. We all carry around silicon with us all the time, uh, doing amazing things. So can't, would it be nice if we can do photonics with silicon? And it turns out that silicon is quite suitable. It's got a, it's transparent. It has a high index. It's uh, well, of course, it's CMOS compatible because CMOS is built around silicon. Um, it, you know, overall, it's a low-cost technology as practiced for electronics. Not necessarily clear yet whether that's going to be true for, for optics, but we want it to be, and we think it can be. Uh, it, it, it can't, you can't make a laser in silicon. At least nobody has yet. If you can, you know, run out of this room and you know, go do it and, you know, and start a company because <laughs> uh, that's a very valuable thing. Um, uh, no electro-optic effect to speak of. There's various kinds of tricks you can play to try and get a couple of picometers per volt, but it's really not too useful. And you can't detect light. So there's, there's things you can't do in silicon. So most people 
right now who are doing silicon photonics have accepted the fact that some hybrid integration is required for, and hybrid integration meaning other materials in silicon being involved in making devices that are of value. So, so we're of course in that camp and we want to use polymers. And uh, so, so this is actually work Roland Himmelhuber has done on a very simple type of modulator. It involves a, a silicon waveguide that's about uh, 250 to 300 nanometers wide uh, and uh, a, uh, a little polymer that's around it and the electrodes are around that. And we, we did the optimization here of that magical gamma factor, that overlap, times the effective index cubed. Uh, is very, that's an important quantity here because silicon has a very high index. Silicon's index is 3.5. Everything else we've been talking about here is about 1.5. So it actually benefits you to have more light in the silicon than you would think as long as it's a, a mode because the silicon basically increases the effective index of your waveguide, which essentially increases your, your uh, figure of merit here. So we, we, hit, the, we hit the optimum uh, there. This is some modeling just showing you what happens. Basically, most of the light is in the silicon here. You see a little bit outside of the silicon in that, in that view. And also, you have to look at what the field is doing. And so we, we basically model both the field and where the optical mode is. And we, again, try and optimize the overlap uh, between them in the uh, polymer. And you can see that the field in the polymer is quite strong in these regions. And uh, this is actual modulator we made. Um, this is some, you know, some data uh, that shows basically the modulation as we apply a triangle uh, wave voltage here. And uh, we estimated that we got about 132 picometers per volt in that device, which is pretty close to what that material we were using, not the 250 picometer, but the other one is supposed to be able to do. So we're very, uh, we're very excited that you know, this area has gotten off the ground now. We just published a paper just at the end of last year on that. Just serendipitously on the way, and this is, and some of you might know, I've used this for other things already because this is becoming a very you know, popular instrument here, is a multi-photon imaging system that ConQ developed. And he initially developed it for bio, uh, for bio uh, uh, imaging purposes and things like that. But we started thinking, gee, maybe we could use this to look at our devices. Because if you look at this device back here, one of the problems with it is, is there's only a very little EO polymer here. And if we pull it, how do we know whether it's pulled well or not? How do we tell? I mean, we have to make a device. It's a lot of work. You saw those pigtails and stuff. It's, you know, it'd be better if we could figure it out earlier in the process and optimize it. So, so this is a beautiful instrument basically based on a, a, a great laser that Khan uh, uh, developed that is a handheld 150 femtosecond laser uh, that uh, always works. You, know, uh, you turn on the pump laser, it works. It's, it's turnkey, unlike most femtosecond lasers, which is why we get so much out of it and we've done so much with it, is because it works every time, you know, as opposed to spending a lot of time tweaking lasers. We just turn it on. And uh, you, this, this system actually looks at both second harmonic, third harmonic, and multi-photon fluorescence uh, at, on any sample that you stick at the uh, at focus here. So we said, why don't we, take our, why don't we take our devices and do the same thing? So that's the laser. You can see how, how, uh, how elegant it is. And we actually make that in my, in my senior laboratory. We actually make this laser uh, you know, once, once the students learn how to make fusions. And we work. Sometimes they work better than the ones Khan makes. So. <laughs> so, so you can actually make that laser pretty easily. And uh, so we, we stuck our, we stuck our um, device in. And what it allows to do is actually see where the material was pulled. Because because basically, if the material is pulled, it, it generates second harmonic because it's a chi-2 effect. So right away, we can see, oh, OK, we've got pretty good polling here. You can see, actually, the fringing fields here coming out the top of the electrode, which is what you'd expect, because I've got a field applied between these two electrodes. You can see the fringing fields. So you can actually, you can actually with one micron resolution with this instrument, determine what your anonymity is on a device like this. And uh, Roland's I got a paper now that's going to be in applied physics letters that, that uh, essentially shows how you do that and how you connect that back to the device performance. Here's an unpolled sample. We, we, we did the reality check. It's okay. We want to make sure we don't see anything with an unpolled sample because there's no guy 2 there. So, uh, so th this, this is a, a tool that we're just, just learning now how to use. It's really, I think, exciting for, um, for this field for characterization of both materials and devices. And the, the next things that we're working on, we've got this new really high 250 picometer per volt polymer in our hand. We've been able to get it up to about 200 so far. It's really a, an art working with a new polymer still. And what we want to do is we want to get that you know, working in compact geometries like this. This is actually a, a chip we've made together with uh, Sandia uh, that initially is going to be a passive chip that I'm 
trying to solve a relatively simple problem in silicon photonics, which is uh, thermal sensitivity. But after that, we'll be moving on to structures like this that are actually electro-optic to make ultra-fast uh, wavelength uh, selective switches and uh, devices like that. Okay, so that's the Kai 2 part. Now I'm, I'm shifting gears uh, for the last uh, half of the talk, uh, less than half, and I'm pretty much on time, to, uh, to two demonstrations of liquid, what I call liquid nonlinear photonics, uh, in, uh, 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 that are third order. And uh, the first question is, why liquids? Okay. Well, liquids, it turns out, have a long history in nonlinear optics. Uh, the DC Kerr effect uh, goes way back. You know, there's Kerr. He was a contemporary of Pockles, as you can tell, by the uh, general <laughs> tire and, uh, photograph. Uh, Raman scattering, uh, discovered by Raman in the uh, 20s, uh, and uh, the optical Kerr effect, stimulated Raman scattering, all were initially uh, studied in liquids. Uh, the nonlinear liquids has substantially higher nonlinearities in silica, especially glass. So uh, the standard nonlinear liquids that people use, carbon disulfide, for example, it has a nonlinearity that's uh, much, much larger than silica, uh, so that you can make much more compact devices, things that are only this long instead of, you know, 100 meters long. And... Uh, these high performance, these kind of very interesting molecules we were looking at before, well, they can often be dissolved in liquids. So you can start to get benefit, some of that, uh, you can get some of the benefit of those amazing materials uh, in, a, in an easier way than putting them into a polymer. And then the, the technological part of this that makes this possible are two things. Uh, one is high quality silica capillary fibers, and another is a, a splicing technique that, uh, that we developed here. And uh, finally, you know, after you've worked, uh, the, you know, for those who are of age, you know, then you know, there's other things you can do with liquids. So, you know, basically, <laughs> it's a long day. So, liquids are a lot of fun. <laughs> so, so, here's a, so, here's liquid core optical fiber uh, that as we practice it. And, and it's funny because we had Professor Ippen here, um, I guess a couple of years ago, to give a colloquium at Khan. And I had lunch with him, and he said, "I did that. I did that twenty. I did that thirty years ago." I was like, "Yeah, we know, but you didn't do it as easily as this." And he and he said, "Yeah, you're right. You know, we could never get it to work more than once, and we gave up because it was a mess. You know, basically the liquid would go all over the place." And the key invention here that uh, really uh, Professor Q came up with is this gap splice. So you've got ordinary fiber and capillary fiber spliced in such a way that you can flow liquid into it. You never have to align it. It's like that forever now. So basically, you put a new liquid in, it's still aligned, you take that liquid out. It's a little bit of trouble getting liquids in and out as the graduate students who work on this can attest to. <laughs> but, but basically, it aligns, it stays aligned for, for basically ever. And uh, you can keep trying different things and new devices and new geometries. So it's really a, a breakthrough in terms of the ability to do these sorts of things and do liquid photonics in fiber. And at the same time, you've got you've got a single mode fiber here. And if you pick your liquid right, so you've got to pick your liquid right. If you pick your liquid wrong, well, it won't guide light because the liquid might have an index that's lower than the clouding index, in which case it can't guide light. Or it might be too high an index, and then I've got multi-mode. So I've got to get the index right, and you can play games to do that. I've also got an issue with, uh, with uh, many liquids have OH and CH bonds. Now, carbon disulfide, happily, does not have those. It only has CS bonds, which are both relatively heavy atoms. So their frequencies of vibration are much further into the infrared, and we don't have so much trouble with that. Um, but uh, you do need a sufficiently high refractive index as well. So I would remind you, just uh, again, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the way of review, step index, we're talking about step index optical fiber here. It's very simple. I've got uh, a core index and a cladding index. Um, I, I assume that the outer cladding radius is, uh, is large enough so I can ignore it. And then I just have to solve the Helmholtz equation in, in, in cylindrical coordinates. Um, you know, as so you all remember, and we assume a solution that looks something like this. So it's, you know, it's got uh, this kind of azimuthal dependence, an unknown radial dependence, and that kind of uh, Z dependence. Beta is the, 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 the thing we're looking for. That's actually the propagation constant along the fiber that we're making. So beta is the thing we're trying to find. It's equivalent to uh, that phase factor uh, that we were working with earlier on in the, in the talk. And uh, at the end of the day, you find out that you've got Bessel's equation. So the solutions are Bessel functions. Uh, and you know, at L equals 0, that's the J0 function. That's what we want. We want the single mode. If we go to higher order modes, then we have higher order Bessel functions and also higher order uh, modified Bessel functions on the outside to keep it physical and not blowing up. OK. So first, the first effect that we, 
really looked at in liquid core fiber was a stimulated Raman scouring. Stimulated Raman scouring uh, has uh, uh, been known, uh, well, Raman scouring has been known since Raman. Uh, stimulated Raman scouring was observed when the laser was first developed. Uh, and essentially, uh, when you send a laser into a material, you generate both Stokes and anti-Stokes frequencies by virtue of the vibrations that are present in the material that are Raman active. And the Stokes frequency is always downshifted, so it's a lower energy. The, uh, the uh, anti-Stokes is always upshifted. Uh, by, for thermodynamic reasons, uh, at room temperature, usually all of your molecules are here, and none of them are here, which is why, or very few of them are here, which is why you usually get a stronger Stokes than anti-Stokes signal, uh, just because uh, statistical mechanics says that's where the molecule should be uh, at room temperature. And stimulated just means that now that I've started, once I've generated some of these photons, the gain spectrum of the material will basically self-select out uh, the, the, the peak of the spontaneous uh, scattering. And as a pump laser continues along, you'll generate more and more photons at the peak of that spontaneous scattering and hence be stimulated. So it's a stimulated process, just like what happens in a laser. So here's SRS in CS2 Elkoff, 50, 50 centimeters long. Um, and you can see we come in with, uh, with uh, a quite uh, weak pulse laser. This is actually a green, green laser in this case. We want to have something we could see. So it's not the 1550 laser. We want to have something we could see. And you can generate, uh, it turns out, seven lines. Because as you generate Raman, you keep generating the next one, the next one, the next frequency. You can just keep moving over. So we generate uh, six, you know, six lines there plus the fundamental. And I can tell you, in grad school we did this, I used to do this in grad school, and we needed a hydrogen Raman cell that was at 300 PSI, and it was like this long, and it was practically a bomb to do the same thing. And we're doing it here in a, in a little capillary fiber with a handheld laser. Uh, so uh, that's progress. Uh, Self-phase modulation is another area we've looked at uh, with liquid core fiber. Self-phase modulation is a, is a process that happens in any uh, in any uh, propagation of a nonlinear through a nonlinear medium, because the third order nonlinear optical effect for a single frequency uh, or a single uh, uh, a single pulse which has a frequency uh, uh, spectrum is expressed this way. So I have the refractive index and then I have the nonlinear index n2 times the intensity. So that's actually my index. Again, this n2 number is very very small, but within a single core uh, single mode optical fiber. Uh, with femtosecond pulses, your intensities get quite large. And the, the physical manifestation of self-phase modulation that you can easily see is that the frequency of the pulse, if you look at the, the instantaneous frequency uh, as a function of time, the frequency actually uh, becomes time dependent and gets uh, lower on the one side of the pulse. You see there's a dependence here on T. So it, go, it dips down uh, at the front of the pulse and comes up at the, at the other side of the pulse if N2 is positive. And N2 usually is positive, okay? So N2 is positive. So what does that create? It creates broadening. So when you send, so this is actual experimental results of, uh, of, of self-phase modulation induced broadening in, in liquid core optical fiber at very low energies, the 3 picojoule, 10 picojoule energies, you get these uh, significant broadening of that pulse, which is due to self-phase modulation. So we're going to something that's 100 nanometers. Um, actually, this work is, was extended to make a supercontinuum source in the mid-infrared uh, that uh, was a paper last year. So, so uh, very easy to see these kinds of effects and study them theory, uh, we did some modeling to basically convince us that we were seeing the right level of the, the N2 for CS2, which is well known. So, okay, that's good. You can, you can work with CS2. But we want, we, we, the, the more recent work we've done is actually looking at well, what can we do about this, because this is not a good thing. For many applications, this spectral broadening we're talking about is a killer. Uh, you know, uh, if you're trying to uh, make a laser, for example, uh, and, and you, 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 the, the pulse keeps getting broader and broader, and what I want is for everything to stay at the same frequency uh, in, in fiber lasers. So this is a, a significant issue. Here, again, you see our input pump pulse. So this is what the, the input pulse looks like. This is what happens after we go through 50 centimeters of, in this case, carbon tetrachloride. Carbon tetrachloride is a great material for this because it has no hydrogen, um, and, and uh, it has a super low loss. And it's easy to get your hands on, um, and it, it's almost the perfect refractive index. But you need to boost the refractive index a little bit to get uh, guiding. It's a little bit low. So we put some CS2 in in order to do that and also to uh, generate uh, some nonlinearity that we can see here. And uh, that, looks, that looks pretty bad. So what happens here 
is uh, we took one of the dyes that are being created by another group that we work with at Georgia Tech, and these dyes are specially designed to have very large microscopic nonlinearities at the third order, and uh, they also are known to have negative uh, chi-3s. So what we did was we added some of that dye to this solution, and what you can see happen was that these broad wings that have been generated are now gone because we've basically compensated the positive N2 of the solution with the negative N2 of the dye. So essentially canceled out the cell phase modulation. And uh, that was reported last year. This is Shiva Shaheen's work. That was reported last year at OFC, and we've got uh, some manuscripts in process. We've used this also to measure the nonlinearity of these materials. So basically, by observing the, observing the phase shift, you can then back out nonlinearity and uh, actually, we compare very well with uh, well-known techniques like Z-Scan. So, and the, the, the advantage of this is you can work with very low concentrations of material, so you can really look at molecular quantities as opposed to Z-Scan is generally done with films uh, that need to be pretty highly packed, and you're looking at a solid-state effect that may be confounded with your actual molecular, molecular quantities. So these are two things we've done with liquid core optical fiber, two of about... 15, I think, at this point. We've done many different uh, demonstrations, Verlon lasing, uh, uh, inverse Raman scattering, a number of other things. But these are the ones that mostly involve organics. So finally, I'm going to stop, start, uh, finish my talk with talking about whispering gallery mode resonators, in particular, bubble resonators. And this is work that Greg Cahoon has uh, been working on for the last couple of years within our BioPaints MURI program. And uh, whispering gallery re 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 resonators have been known acoustically for a long time. Essentially, if you go into cathedrals, um, there's, a, there's a famous place, if you've been to the Christian Science uh, Center in Boston, they have this thing called the Maparium, which is a, is a true whispering gallery mode. You go in there, it's a map of the world, it's sort of 1935 or so, so it looks kind of weird because <laughs> the countries are different. But you can stand on one side of this and talk and, you know, and whisper and somebody can hear on the other side. It was actually, the, the U.S. Uh, Senate was actually originally that way. And they didn't know it. <laughs> so people would sit on one side and talk, and they could talk to their colleagues on the other side about something without anybody else knowing they were talking. Um, and uh, once they figured that out, they changed the design. So it didn't work that way anymore because uh, it's kind of an unfair advantage depending on where you were sitting in a heated discussion. But, uh, but, but whisper gallery modes can also be extended to optics. And this is probably the most famous one. These are these toroidal, beautiful toroidal micro-resonators that uh, the Bahala group at Caltech has been making now for about 10 years. And uh, they've done just about everything known to man with these things. And they're made by a very interesting process that involves a CO2 laser. And, and uh, it's very cool. So, so you can do some neat things. We made these. I'm not going to talk about this. But we made these by femtosecond micro-machining downstairs on the second floor. So we actually, uh, we actually spin the fiber and shoot a femtosecond laser at it. And we can make you know, things we want. But, th but this is about micro-bubbles. So I'm going to talk about the micro-bubbles. So, so the micro-bubbles will be take a capillary and... Uh, you take a capillary and you uh, you uh, heat it and pressurize it and uh, and it balloons out. You basically make a balloon, and uh, you, know, you can use things like uh, we're looking here with uh, with a fusion splicer uh, uh, microscope. But essentially, you use a torch. You can use any number of things to heat it up uh, locally, and then uh, you've got something you can flow liquids into, and also something that's a micro resonator. So you can introduce kind of arbitrary materials into a micro resonator in environment. You can see you know. And Greg's not very good at this, so you can make thickness. The wall thicknesses are two to five microns. It's pretty good. That's basically you know uh, getting to where uh, a, a single mode waveguide uh, thicknesses are even. So you've got pretty good control of the modes, and uh, you uh, you do have the problem with these sorts of things of getting the light into them, because uh, they have a very high Q, and very high Q means it's hard to couple light into it because if it were so, if it were easy, the Q wouldn't be that high. You know, so so you do have to go to some trouble, you make a taper in a fiber, and uh, Greg's actually uh, designed this system uh, based on, actually, uh, some, some fair portion of this was made by 3D printing, so you may have heard of that technology. And basically, we laid out the you know, SOLIDWORKS and, and ordered, uh, ordered parts, and they came in, they worked great. And so this is completely automated and can make very, very small fibers that then we can bring up to the resonator and essentially use a directional coupling type principle to get the light into the resonator. And uh, the, the Q factors we can get are about t 10 to the 6. Uh, the Q factor, of course, is usually defined this way, where you know, it's the frequency that you're at divided by the spread of frequencies. And uh, you can see a number of different um, 
the number of different resonators here. Uh, I think this one actually should be over there. It kind of moved when I moved it. But th this is one of our early uh, disk resonators uh, here and here. And then that's, uh, that's a, a micro bubble, a micro bubble output there. So that this guy should be over here. OK. And how good are these things? Well, you can buy a Fabry Pro from Thor Labs. That's a typical resonator cavity. And a Fabry Pro from Thor Labs has a finesse of about 200. And you can you can get ones you know that are higher than that, but you know typically if you go and buy a, a, a fabric pro, it's 200. The finesse of this micro bubble is about 2,000. The finesse of a microsphere, which we also work with and make, is about 2 million. Okay, so 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 they're much better than uh, than you can make a uh, a, a fabric pro uh, uh, as. So why are these good for nonlinear optics? Well, in nonlinear photonics, the main reason is that once you get power into the resonator, the circulating power is very, very high. And, and the, the increase in power compared to the power you have outside is proportional to the Q factor. So you wind up putting in milliwatts and getting watts, and, and, uh, you know, or hundreds of watts, depending on your Q factor, as you can see here. So I take that, I put that together with the fact that I have these small volumes. I have a very high uh, local uh, field that I can do all sorts of things with. Raman lasing, thermal generation, frequency, frequency at home generation have all been demonstrated. Here's a simple demonstration we did in our lab with a microsphere where it's cascaded Raman. So we come in with a 980 nanometer laser here. This is the first Raman line. This is the second Raman line. This is the third Raman line, uh, and so forth. So you can, at, again, milliwatt powers, you can easily demonstrate uh, uh, nonlinear optic effects that uh, previously you know, would take uh, pulse lasers, uh, large pulse lasers, and uh, very high powers. So what we did actually was uh, we have an interest in various kinds of chromophores for this program that have interesting, um, a lot of them biochromophores, and we're, we're moving on to that next. But we, we, we wanted to look at basically multi-photon pumping of chromophores and see if we could use these micro bubbles to actually do that. So essentially uh, create uh, two-photon absorption. So two-photon absorption, if you're not familiar, you basically you take two photons to get to the excited state instead of one. Once you're up there, for most molecules, they don't know where the photon, they don't know how they got, how they got there. They basically get to a state, and then they fluoresce. And, and often the fluorescent spectrum will not look uh, markedly different from the one photon uh, fluorescent spectrum for two photon absorption. But the two photon absorption process itself depends on the square of the intensity. It's a third order nonlinear optical process. It depends on the square, square of the intensity. It depends on this very small number, sigma two, which is uh, the cross section. Uh, the typical unit for cross section is Gilbert Myers, uh, named after the great female uh, physicist, uh, Gilbert Meyer, who first uh, theoretically looked at two photon absorption. So we have uh, 13 Gilbert Meyer uh, at 980 is actually not a very good number. I mean, for Roman 60 d the dye that we picked, but we we thought, well, let's start let's start and see if we can see uh, anything from that dye. Uh, you can see that you can actually get much higher numbers, but that was a convenient dye that we had around. And uh, this is actually uh, about we use about a five millimolar solution. We couple light into the micro bubble with our taper. You can see. This is kind of showing you where you can't see them on this scale, so we have to fill them in. So the resonator is here, the taper is here, and we collect the light over here. And uh, we could actually see the light coming from this resonator with less than a milliwatt going in. You know, so we got multi photon absorption and visible fluorescence with less than a, mul uh, with a milliwatt going into the resonator. So very efficient and uh, basically reusable. That's the great thing about this. So I, I put Roman 60D in here. Okay, now I want to look at some other chromophore. Fine, just clean it out, put the new chromophore in, look at that one, and use that same micro bubble as, as many times as you can before you break it. Greg sometimes turns the power up to see how far it can go. And there's problems. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, you know, up to that point, you can do it. And this is actually a result. You know, you can see here the spectrum that we uh, detected. This is actually the pictures of the visible fluorescence, and you can see the somewhat the shape of the uh, resonator coming into play there. And uh, we expected, actually, it's interesting, we initially expected it to be uh, square law, because that, that, that equation I showed you was square law, but it's actually not, and, uh, and, and uh, there's an interesting analogy with uh, a cavity uh, second mile generation. Basically what's happening is as the intensity is increasing, so is the loss. So Q is actually going down as the intensity goes up. So that's, that's re reducing the, uh, the, the power law dependence. And if you take that into account, you, you actually get uh, this kind of uh, dependence, which is less than two, more like one and a half for this system. And that's uh, in a paper that we, uh, we have submitted to optics letters right now. So in conclusion, uh, hopefully I've convinced you that EO polymers are, 
are for real. They're here. They, people should start trying to use them for a variety of, of different things. We're trying to use them to make both uh, very uh, highly efficient uh, conventional modulators, shall we say, and also for uh, next generation silicon modulators. Other core optical fiber is that's really fun. You can do nonlinear optics and nonlinear photonics in uh, in a uh, uh, very uh, uh, simple way with uh, conveniently uh, uh, activated femtosecond lasers and uh, materials that we can get our hands on. Finally, the, the micro bubble is a, a really nice vehicle for looking at this interface between uh, resonator enhanced nonlinear photonics, which has been pretty pretty uh, richly explored, but a new area of microfluidics, and you know this, these naturally integrate together. So we're thinking that there's some real opportunities here in the in the in the bi in the biolo biological area for looking at uh, biological materials that are in microfluidic uh, types of uh, chips and adding on this uh, capability to look at their properties with uh, nonlinear photonics. So I just wanted to also acknowledge um, uh, not everybody in our group, but you know, people who specifically contributed to the things I talked to today uh, on the left-hand side. And uh, of course, uh, our collaborators in EO materials and third-order materials, and then funding from a variety of sources that um, have uh, helped us do this work. So thanks for your attention. <laughs> Questions for Bob? Yeah. For the RF 